Hey everybody, welcome back to the vlog and thank you once again for joining me for Tea Time. I really appreciate each and every one of you. So today we're gonna be talking about Panasonic and the S1, S1R, some updates, what do we know about it? And get down into the question of how can Panasonic compete with Sony and Canon and Nikon when it comes to the full frame mirrorless space. So before we get into the Panasonic stuff, I wanna show you some images that I captured over the weekend of the blood moon the blood moon lunar eclipse right it was really kind of just eventful they were talking about it on the news they talked about it all over the place i'm like you know what why don't we go and do it this time so i pulled out one of the torpedoes this is a 300 mil l glass from canon you can see it's beat all up but i tell you what this thing is a trooper. It's been around for probably about 10 years and it's just amazing. It always does the job and it does it well. Anyways, we pulled this thing out, threw it on the camera and the tripod and started taking some pictures. So here you can see an image of the moon, how it would normally be seen just before the lunar eclipse. Now the next image, you can see that it's gotten extremely dark. It's probably like 10% of its luminosity. So here you can see the beginning of the lunar eclipse where the sun's shadow is now seen on the moon. The next image you can see, it's almost in totality here. We're almost at the very end of that process. And now we boost it up a little bit. We just grab all that gain that we can get from the sensor. And now we can see what's happening behind the scenes. And we can see that blood moon effect where we're getting that orangey from the sun wrapping around on the moon, which is absolutely beautiful. And as we go further on, we can see it getting darker and finally a little bit darker until the last image here, you can barely see the moon at all. I have the camera cranked up right now to be able to get this image. So it's really quite fascinating to me. I just, I love it to be able to see this and know that this is how we found out or discovered that the earth was not flat so many, many moons ago, pardon the pun. That's kind of that. I hope you enjoyed that. It was kind of cool. I had a blast with it. So anyways, let's get into Panasonic and the SR and the SR1. Now let's start out with what we know of course, it is a 24 megapixel on the S1 and a 47 megapixel sensor on the S1R. They're both going to have dual image stabilization. All right. So what that means is you're going to have IBIS and internal lens stabilization. So you'll be able to use both. Now, before I go on with these, let me show you something that I found over here on Photo Rumors, which was kind of cool. It shows the Panasonic GH5S, the S1R, and the G9 side by side. And here you can see the first image, which is the centerpiece you could see is that S1R. And you can see the size difference. And then the GH5 on the left and the G9 on the right. Now, Look at the size of the sensor. It's massive, right? Absolutely massive, a full frame comparison to the Micro Four Thirds. Now, the camera bodies themselves, I think is what's interesting here is there's not that big of a difference. If we go to the next picture, we can see the back. Of course, we have that S1R in the center not that big of a difference. We could also now see it from the top. Yes, it's a little bit bigger, especially when we see it next to the GH5 to the left, but it's still not too bad. I mean, it's not that much bigger than the micro four thirds. It was always this whole thing where you shoot micro four thirds because it's smaller and all this stuff. How much smaller is it? Yes, it is smaller, but I would say not by that much. And by the time you start strapping lenses onto them, Eh, it's not that big of a deal. And finally, we have this image from the side, which really shows the difference between them. Um, I like that a lot. So once again, kudos over there to Photo Rumors for putting this up online. I thought that was really cool to be able to show you guys. Now, next item was autofocus. Now, the autofocus for these cameras, for the S1 and the S1R, is going to be that DFD, which is their depth of defocus. I thought they were going to go with an on-sensor phase detection like all the rest of the manufacturers. They decided to stick with their contrast-based autofocus detection. Now, will that bite them later? I really don't know, but we will see. Now, we know a lot of pros want dual card, right? And dual card slots is available on these two cameras. It's going to have an XQD card slot as well as an SD card slot. For me, I would like to just see one or the other, just have two of them, but that's just my personal opinion. Now, the rear screen. 
The rear screen, a lot of people say, oh, we want flippy screens. Eh, they're going to do their tri-axle tilt thing that they do, but it's not going to have a fully articulated back panel like a lot of Canon cameras do. I would say it's more akin to a Fujifilm X-T3 is what they're going to have on the back. Now, as far as lens and lens lineup, for 2020, Panasonic states that they're going to have 10 new lenses for their S line for their S1 and the S1R by 2020. And now Sigma also has promised 14 new lenses for 2019. That's this year, guys. That's a lot of lenses they're going to be putting out for that L mount, which is really interesting. Now, as far as lenses coming out with this camera, it's still rumored that we're going to have a 50 millimeter f1.4, a 25 to 105, and a 70 to 200. Now, what is the aperture on those two? last ones. I would hope 2.8, but who knows? It might be something like a 4.0. We really don't know as of yet. Now, pricing. Pricing has remained the same. There's still no more guidance on it. You're looking at about $4,400 for the SR1. Now, bear in mind, the Nikon Z7 is $1,000 less at $3,400. So I don't know how that's going to fly, but that's something we can talk about later. Next is what Panasonic has said about their G series. And this was a thing that we talked about a few videos ago. Are they gonna continue with the micro four thirds? And they've reiterated that yes, and reaffirmed, let's call it, that yes, the smaller micro four thirds, the G series, is going to be continued. They're going to continue to make these. But what they've also stated is that the S1 and the S1R is not or are not a video-based camera. They are solely photography-based cameras. And their G line is going to continue down their video series. So maybe the GH6 will be even better for video. Kind of strange to me. I think that's very strange. And the reason why I don't get that is because they have been touting and boasting 4K at like 50p or 60p. Now, that's something that no other manufacturer has done as of yet. So if you're boasting that but saying it's not a video machine, I don't get it. I don't know. It's kind of like double talk but we'll see how that plays out. Now, also they talked about having a brand new Lumex Pro service. Now, we know that many photographers, many pro photographers, look at Canon and Nikon and Sony for their pro services. So if there's something that goes south, they know they're going to have that lens or that camera replaced or repaired post haste, right? Extremely quickly because they are pros and they can't be down very long, or at least they can get a rental in very quickly. And now with the Lumex Pro services, that is what supposedly Panasonic is doing similar to Canon, Nikon, and Sony. So my question to you guys is simply this. How does Panasonic compete with Canon, Nikon, and Sony? Now, there's a couple of things that I look at. I think that the answer to that is, yes, they can compete. No, they can't compete. And a couple of things that I want to kind of bring out, and I want you guys to give me your opinion, is number one, I think they're going to feel a lot of growing pains on this camera because they've been doing micro four thirds for a long time. And we know they have those GH5, GH5S pushed to the limit, all right? And they're not dealing with a lot of heat. Or if they are, there's a lot of heat disbursement in the camera built in that we don't see a lot of shutdowns due to heat. Now, once they go with this massive sensor in the similar size body as we showed at the beginning, how are they going to deal with heat? That is going to be a Gen 1 problem in my personal opinion. Also, I think that that flip screen, they decided to go with a flip screen that only flips, you know, that tri-flip in comparison to a fully articulating back panel. Will that hurt them when it comes to their video guys? Now, they're saying this is not a video camera. Now, maybe they're saying it so that they didn't have to put a flip screen in it. I don't know. But I know there's a lot of guys that shoot advertisement. They shoot with a GH5S and they've really been looking for a Panasonic full frame that's similar. So a lot of people are going to try to use this for video. How is that going to adversely affect things? I don't know. And finally, my thoughts on this autofocus. Autofocus has been a slight issue. A lot of the people that I talk to that shoot ads, a lot of times they're having to shoot manual focus. The reason being is it hunts a lot. Now, not changing the autofocusing system 
from that contrast over to a phase detection and on sensor phase detection system, that could be another problem that might rear its head. But on the positive side, I see Panasonic as a company that has come out with the GH line that's just crushed it. I mean, when it comes to video, they have really done some amazing work and a lot of people are using that camera for video productions, even though it's got a tiny micro four thirds sensor in it. So they really know what they're doing when it comes to video. As far as photo, we'll see what ends up happening. What people are saying is they're, they're really thinking that this is going to be an amazing, amazing camera for photo. And some folks have already seen some of those images that have come out supposedly by the camera and they are just incredible. So we'll see what ends up happening. Once again, you have a 24 megapixel and you have that 47 megapixel. Pricing is the issue in my personal opinion that is going to be one of the major deciding factors, right? Price, how does it compare to everyone else? And what is the value that someone is going to get going with Panasonic over Sony, Canon, and Nikon? So I wanna hear from you, what do you think? What are your thoughts now that Panasonic is delving deep into the Red Sea of full frame mirrorless wars that's going on? It's bloody water and how are they going to fare? I wanna know what your thoughts are. So that's it guys, if you enjoy my content, as always, please throw me a big thumbs up, that would really be helpful. And don't forget to smash that subscribe button so you get all my content when it becomes available and click the bell icon so when it is available, you will be notified of it. And finally, head over to my website, jchristina.com where you can find all the photography tools that I've invented for you and me over the years. And hopefully there's something there that you might like. And if there is, please pick it up and support me. That's it. I'm out of here for yet another vlog. We'll see you in the next one. Happy shooting.